Welcome to the round table here at Calvary Sunday. God, we're studying the book of Galatians. Uh, what an amazing study it is because once you go through it, you're going to realize a lot of freedoms that you didn't know were available to you. And um, there are things throughout this book that help you understand that because there are religious ideologies that are actually attacked in this book by the Apostle Paul. He's, he's the writer of this book. So there are some things in our, in our own lives, traditions, Pastor Eddie, there are things that we have learned in certain church life that we've had that may or may not be biblical. And what I mean by that is we, we might cling to something and it might not be as real as we think it is. And that's how church traditions can sometimes start. Um, we are told in this book that false teachers infiltrated their ranks, led them astray, and started teaching false doctrine. Once it's taught, it's then lived, passed on to the next generation, and before long, it becomes a doctrine of the church, even though, where do you find that? Exactly. And so, you know, a lot of people ask me about the Assemblies of God because we have what's called the 15, or sorry, 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God. And what I say about that is there's probably way more or we could reduce it to far, excuse me, far less. Wow, that was wild. That's loose. We could probably reduce it to less, but we settled on 16, and every one of those are, are biblical foundations. You can find them in scripture. This is why we believe what we believe. And you could, you know, like Congress does, you can keep adding, adding, and adding, and adding, and adding, and adding, and adding. Which we do to some level because there are cultural phenomena that are not written about in the 16 fundamental truths. So we write a position paper. Uh, we write them on matters of, of cultural context. What does the Bible have to say about this? What I like about the Assemblies of God is they always refer to the text. It's not what is my opinion. Hey, what does Bob feel about this? And hey, what does Carol think about that? Let's write a paper on what they think. Now let's go back to the source and do what we're supposed to be taught. So when we come to a guy like Paul, he tells us in this book, do you remember who his source was? The Old Testament. The Old Testament, number one, and Gamaliel, Gamaliel's teacher. teacher, and who was his? And his Christian teacher, Barnabas. No, there was one you missed. Christ himself. Oh, Christ himself was my schoolmaster. Yes. The one who taught me these very truths, but every truth that he taught could be backed up by his Old Testament uh, teachings. So, hey, hi everyone. Welcome to Pastor Eddie's a nice conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, why don't you uh, greet everybody, open us in prayer, and we'll jump into where we're at. Welcome to Calvary Assemblies of God, to our Galatians Bible study. As we've been going through the letters of Paul, we are now in Galatians chapter 2. And I think we we're going to have a great time today. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the power of your word that liberates us from things that we believe to be true that might be wrong, and that we can walk in a true liberty in a relationship with you, Christ Jesus. And I pray that as we walk in this liberty, it will be noticed by those who are close to us, who love us, who know us best, and they will want the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. And we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Ketchup's, uh, there was a little fight that we were uh, navigating through. It was the Apostle Paul uh, wrestling with Peter. Can you go back before we go forward? Give us a little background where we're at. So Paul is hanging out with a bunch of Gentiles, with Barnabas, and Peter came for a visit. He's hanging out with the Gentiles, and they're enjoying life in the liberty that we have in Christ with Gentiles. All of a sudden, these brethren from Jerusalem come to visit, and Peter says, oh, oh no, I'm not with them. I, I don't eat and, and hang out with them. Uh, I'm a Jew of the Jews. So he started hanging out with these brethren from Jerusalem. And Paul's like, what's going on here? And all of a sudden, Barnabas starts heading that way towards Peter. What? What? And so Paul withstood Peter to his face, the Bible says, and, and, and said to him, 
Why you, who are living like a Gentile, all of a sudden want to drag them to live like a Jew, which thing we, even we ourselves, could not do? And that's where we are. Yes. So isn't that amazing? A, a, a truth that you can't live. It's not possible to sustain the law. Uh, only Christ can fulfill the law. We all know that, right? We could never, on our best day, go through the Old Testament and say, I'm going to live like an ancient Jew. There's just no plausible way. There is too much demand. There is, quite frankly, if we even wanted to, uh, we, would, we would require you, when you sin, to bring a sin offering to the church, which is a, uh, a barn animal of some sort, depending upon your uh, economic ability, you would bring a farm animal, we would hand you a sword and you would slaughter it and we would sprinkle the blood on the altar and that would be the process of just dealing with each and every sin. And then once a year we would have the high priest come in and uh, do a, a sacrifice for the entire community and uh, the day of atonement would be set forth that all of our sins are covered. And that would be it. I mean, can you imagine, you know, what our parking lot would look like? You know, come Sunday, you're bringing your barn animals in, into the church one by one, and you would have to confess your sin publicly uh, be, before you slaughtered the animal. I mean, there's a lot involved. I mean, you just think, all right, following the law means following the Old Testament. Ten laws, how hard is it? No, there's... There's a bunch of uh, moral laws and then there's ceremonial laws by which none of us could ever do. And that's what Paul's referring to here. And there's something about becoming a Christian that you could never fulfill those, but Christ is going to fulfill all of those for you. He became cursed, sin, and death for us so that he can liberate us that we don't have to do any of that. He became even a sacrifice for us, a sin sacrifice. And it's amazing that we can drift back to the thinking that there are things that I have to do for Christ to be happy with me. Now, I don't want you to think there's nothing involved because each one of us has a call on our lives and we have to fulfill that call of what he's doing in our hearts and lives. But I can't fulfill Eddie's call, Eddie can't fulfill mine, and neither can either of us fulfill your call and you can't fulfill ours. We have to walk in close proximity with Christ so we know our calling and be liberated in not a religious situation, but a relational one. And I, I know I get into singing, but one of my favorites is, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. Like, I believe that thoroughly. I believe that he walks with me. I believe that he talks with me. I believe that, I know this is shocking, sometimes I begin to walk in error. And he has to, like a horse, you know how to get kind of. The run and the staff. Yeah, you don't just. Hurt me. You, you got to get directed in the right way. And a lot of people, you know, they, they don't like that, that there's a whipping aspect to those racing horses. But the faster you go, the quicker you can get off, off the beaten uh, tra uh, trail, so to speak. And so there's this sense that, all right, God walks with me, He talks with me, He corrects me, He adjusts my journey so that I'm walking with him. And if I all of a sudden stop that relationship and say, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of all of this nonsense, I'm going to walk over here in a religious ideology. I just move that far, that much further away from what Christ can do for me. Are you all, are you all understanding that? And so that's what Peter's getting scolded for. He's trying to move a group of people away from freedom to being saddled by a law that they cannot fulfill. And so we we're, we ended in verse 16, so obviously we're going to pick it up in verse 17. So Pastor Eddie, could you read that for us? And we'll, and we'll help. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So what's he saying? Break it down. All right, so... We are seeking to, to say we are Christians. We, we name the name of Christ upon ourselves. And, but wait a minute. You can't call yourself Christ. You're a sinner. If, if, if 
therefore, I'm a sinner, but I'm a minister of Christ. Is, is Christ a sinner? God forbid. So there's this thing that, that, that happens in the life of a Christian. Jesus on the cross washed away how many of our sins? All of us. And then in him, taking upon him our sin and washing it away, God puts his righteousness on us. How much righteousness is on us? All of it. The righteousness of Christ. So in the, in the mindset of a believer, that is the hope that we live for, that we live with. That I am just as righteous as Christ. Hold on, you're a liar because you're a sinner. That's what the Bible tells us. This is what's happening here. So, if I'm going to say, okay, because this is still Paul confronting Peter, the law, the law calls us sinners. The law says, do all this law. Or die. So if I'm going to put on myself the law, I've just taken on Christ. Now I am named sinner. I'm clothed with sinner, the title sinner. This is what's happening here. This is what he's confronting Peter. So let me ask you, I don't know if anybody did ever feel like this way. But um, how many of you remember the moment you're like on fire for Christ? You got saved and you're just like, yes, yes. But we, we all know that feeling of, all right, if we can't maintain at that level of energy. We can't maintain at that level of excitement. And we feel a drop off. And along with the drop off comes some ungodly mm -hmm. things. We drift back. Anyone ever drift back to some things that... And then you're like, oh, God, i got to get saved. <laughs> Again. Again. But I, I, I want to no, categorically no. tell you, you don't have to get saved again. Right? right? Amen. You, you need to mature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, there is the born-again experience, you know, in John chapter 4. Where we learn, you know, Nick at night and all that discussion that they had. Uh, Nicodemus with Jesus and how can a man, when he is old, go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Uh, you're not, you're not climbing back into your mother's womb. What's born of flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is the spirit. You're, it's your spirit that needs to be born. Yeah. So your spirit comes to life. You, you gave your life to Christ, but that excitement drifts off, and then you drift into some other category. Sometimes religious, sometimes sacrilegious. Yes. One, one or the other. And we were talking about ditches. We can fall into one of these ditches. One of re religiosity. One of I'm going to swing the pendulum in the other direction, and I'm going to I'm going to cast off Christ entirely. And we get stuck in this. When I'm not when I'm not walking with Christ, we get stuck. Can you all agree with that? We yes. get stuck in this panic mode, what am I going to do now? And that's actually what we're watching Peter do. He, he, he cascades, he, he crushes under the weight of, oh my gosh, I was just living free. What will my parents think? What will my relatives in Israel think if they saw me eating bacon? I am out, I'm going to be thrown aside, I'm eating like a Gentile, and we assume bacon. But yeah. But the reality is there, there's so many things that in the Jewish diet that they just could not even partake of. But of all people, Peter got the vision. Kill and eat. Kill and eat, right? Rise, kill, eat, Peter. But I call clean, not call right. so, so he's the one that gets the vision, and then he's the one walking in hypocrisy. But I want you to know that you need a Paul in your life, and you're going to have people like Peter, that are always trying to pull you in some religious stream. And you're going to have to navigate that all the while moving away from your initial salvation experience, trying to navigate the world, and we get confused. And if we don't have Paul's in our life to say, knock it off. 
Don't you know your theology? That's This is what he's going through here. Yeah. Knock it off. You're confused. And you're confused because your theology's confused. And we need people in our lives. So don't get mad at people that like knock you in the head and say, hey, knock it off. Your theology is off. We're not mad at you. Paul's not you know, ticked off at, at Peter, except personally. not personally, no. but there's injury happening to the body of Christ because he's condoning something that's theologically off, off base. So that's what I see here in, in verse 17 is he's correcting theology. Exactly. You're off, dude, and this is where you're off. So, you know, or he's not a minister of sin when you sin. You're wrong when you sin, and you don't have to get saved again, but you do need to repent, right? Just like when you have a fight with somebody, you shouldn't leave that open-ended. You all know that, right? You can't just say things that are sharp and cutting to someone and walk out of the room and then walk back in and be like, hey, life's good, right? No, you got you to gotta fix stuff. And so that, that's kind of what's going on here. When we mess up in the God sphere, we need people to speak into our lives. And, you know, I think the saying is everybody needs a Paul and everybody needs a Timothy. Yeah. You need somebody teaching you and you need somebody to teach. teach too. Or Barnabas or Timothy or any of the, the people that we, we've noted. But uh, as we go on, remember, we're still in the middle of, of the conversation between Paul and Peter. He is standing into his face, correcting his theology, showing him where he's wrong, and having, a, I think, the decency of heart as a brother in Christ to say, Here's what we believe. Not that garbage. Here's what we believe in Christ. This is who he is. So continue. Verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. The things which I destroyed is the law. So look at it this way. We have a chain and we're holding logs onto a truck. How many of the links in that chain need to break for the log to fall off the truck? Just one. Just one. So the whole law in the book of Deuteronomy, I, I highly recommend reading it. Um, it's, it's one speech that, that Moses gave on a, in between two mountains. And he said, all right, you guys on that side of the mountain and you other half of the Israel on the other side. On the other mountain. You guys on this mountain, call out curses. And you guys on this side, call out blessings. And the, the list of curses and blessings are pretty much the same list. Blessed are you if you do this. Blessed are you if you do this. Blessed are you if you do this. Cursed are you if you do not do this. Cursed are you if you do not do this. Amongst the curses, cursed are you if you do not continue in all of this law. And then he says, then he has the audacity to say, and I don't make this covenant just with us. I make this covenant with us, with you, and those who are not here. Uh, that, That's would be, that would be that would be us. <laughs> so if I'm gonna put you under the law, Gentiles, go do all of it now. Yeah. Yeah, and you know. To go right along with it, I'm going to take a little um, rabbit trail here. You remember in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, if you have sinned in one part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. This is what Pastor Eddie is talking about. You can't just say, I'm a liar, and that's it. Nope, you're a lawbreaker. That, that's where God lands on that subject matter. And then he, I think, I, I project this anyway. Would you like me to judge you by the law? Or would you like me to judge you by grace? Oh, yeah. It's up to you. Because if you want to go by the law, we'll go by the law. Tip for tat, line by line. Let's put your, your life, whoa. Let's put your life up on the projector. And uh, let's, let's, let's go through it and see if you broke the law. And you know, that's the way of the master that we were talking about. Have you broken any of the laws? Yeah. Well, we know. We all know our life. We'd be horrified if our life was up on the screen for everybody to watch. You know, we'd be like, no, 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 don't show that part. Don't show that. Don't show that. Don't show that. That's embarrassing, right? And so God says, all right, how do you want to do this? 
Do you want to live under the law? Do you want to be, uh, or do you want me to, to not bring up the law? Let's bring up the fact that I died for you on the cross, that I fulfilled the law and the penalty because you deserve death. The wages of sin is death. So Jesus stands in our stead and says, you know what? I don't want you to die. I, I do want you to fulfill the law by coming into a relationship with me. I'll, I'll die for you. You get to go free. Isn't that amazing? What happens in that transaction? I think it's a slap in the face to walk right by him and try to go back and fulfill some gratifying thing to bless God or to treat God this way by going back to the law. And I think that's the crux of verse 18. What I built has been destroyed. Yep. And in other, other uh, writings, it says I count it all done. Yep. You know, a pile of crapola, everything that I've ever done. Now I just rebuilt it. Yeah, now I'm going to rebuild that and offer it to God. It stinks. So, point taken, right? For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. The law says that I am dead to the law. What? Yeah, please explain. See, the, the law in its entirety says, if you fail, the death penalty is upon you. If the death penalty is upon you, you are dead. However, there is a way of escape from death by the death of an innocent, a lamb, or a goat, a sin -off. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the law that a lot of people miss. The law says every single day there are two sin offerings offered at the temple constantly, one in the morning and one in the evening. These two sin offerings every single day for all the people. And yet the people still think, well, if I sin, I need to bring an offering. And they forget, I am covered by the morning sacrifice, by the evening sacrifice. I am dead. I'm good as dead. But because they're dead, I'm covered. Right. So being dead to the law, um, Paul teaches elsewhere, he celebrates the law because he wouldn't know what sin was unless the law defined what sin was. So we're not saying ignore Deuteronomy. Read it. It alerts your spirit to what God calls sin. Oh, I didn't know that was a sin. I didn't know that was a sin. Now, I was a young driver. You can all make fun of me later on or, or now, whatever. But I remember being in the big city, and I needed to find a parking place. And in big cities, it's only parallel parking on the side of the road. And cities are packed where you've got to find one of those garages, a parking garage, a few alternatives, parking lots that people are, you know, killing you, you know, $40 to park here for an hour. And just crazy stuff, right? So I'm going down the highway this way, and I see a, a parking space over there. So I dart across traffic, and I park this way against the flow of traffic. I thought, I'm going. I got a parking spot with a meter. Get this, you only had to put a nickel. Show my age. You had to drop a nickel in there, crank that thing, and howl. Woo! Hallelujah. Parked in the big city for an hour, for a nickel. I came out to a ticket. Yes. Like, oh. <laughs> what I do? Does anyone know what I do wrong? I parked. Who ever heard of a stupid rule like this? <laughs> I'm parked. But I was parked facing the wrong direction, which could create an accident, both getting into that space or coming out of that space, it creates an opportunity for an accident. And so I learned that lesson real clear right away because the price that I had to pay was far outside of my budget. You know what I mean? It's just 
uh, can I pay you like a dollar a year for the rest of my life? I mean, this seems high, but I was ignorant. Ignorance of the law. That's what the judge said. Exactly. I took it all the way to the high courts. And the judge says, ignorance is no excuse. But if someone doesn't write the law, and then you don't find out what it is, you will continue to do that wrong until you get caught. Right? Yep. And once you get caught, you'll learn what the penalty is. That's the same way with sin. You don't know what sin is until you crack that Bible and you're like, whoa! I didn't know that that was falling into the sin category. So you mean to tell me that the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil didn't actually have any special ingredient in the fruit? That the ingredient that opened your eyes to the fact that it's sin to eat it was the fact that you ate it? <laughs> right. So, I mean, yes, there's a catalog of sin. And some of them do seem ridiculous. Um, the mixing of certain vegetables in the field. You read that and you're like, okay, God doesn't like you to grow this vegetable with that one, evidently. By the way, just to let you know, you probably all are sitting right now. The Bible in the law says, do not make garments mixed with two different cloths. Yes. So if you're wearing cotton and polyester together. Yeah, it says blend of any kind. Yes, you um, There's some in Leviticus that says if a man bars the edges of his beard, you're done. You have sinned. So you start to read these and you're like, all right, there's moral law. That's not like that's not like equated with murder. But it is a ceremonial law and there's moral law. But it doesn't matter if you broke any of them. You're guilty of the other. You're guilty of all of them. So it's just like, what did God want out of the ceremonial stuff? What did he want out of the clothing? What did he want out of the gardening? What did he want out of it? And you start to, it's, I don't know, it's just like being in a family. There's if you're in a family, your family folds towels a certain way. And then you go to somebody else's house and they fold towels. God help you if you get married. We don't fold towels like that here. We fold towels like this. This is how it's done. But I think there's being in the family of God, you just start to line up and say, hey, this is what he wants. This is what he likes. I want to like what he likes. But what I find in culture is this massive objection. He is a tyrant. He expects this, 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 and this. Yeah, but he also knows you can't do any of it until you come into a relationship and he starts to write on your heart what needs to be done. And that's, that's the whole point. It's the heart. You see, the law and the minutia of the law didn't come in until the people said, Moses, we don't want to hear the voice of God. We want you to tell us what he says, and whatever he says, we will do. Oh, you want to do and not know? Okay. Let's so he gave them a do list. He gave them a huge do list. You want to do list here. You know one of my favorite laws? It says this, if you're unclean, we're going to take some water with some ashes in it, and we're going to take some piss up, wash you. You can't wash yourself. So I have to hold the bowl and wash you. So now that I've washed you, you're clean. But I'm touching the bowl with ashes of a dead animal. I'm unclean now. <laughs> I need somebody to wash me. Who, who wants to wash me? It's an endless cycle. Never ending. And that, you're right. It's an objection to a relationship. And God says you can't do this. Forget it. Let's fulfill it all in Christ. You walk with him and he'll tell you what needs to be done. But it is an exciting journey nevertheless. Uh, verse 19. I already read that. Verse 20. Verse 20. Well, verse 20. This, this is my life verse. If you ever want to know, what's, what's your life verse, Pastor Kevin? This is it. Yeah. I love this verse. And it's in the middle of an argument between two guys. <laughs> I love it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. I, I can't think of a more climatic end to a speech. Peter, you come in playing this game? Let me tell you how wrong you are in your theology, and here's where I land. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. How liberating that you don't have to play games with anybody. Your only responsibility, if I can paint it Christianity, your only responsibility is to walk with him and listen to what he tells you to do and do it. If someone has an objection to that, you may have to struggle through whose liberty is being infringed upon. Is it yours or is it the collective unity of Christians? And what I mean by that is the Apostle Paul will get into a discussion in another book, but he will talk about um, people who are vegetarians versus people who are meat eaters. And he's like, look, I can eat whatever. But. If you are troubled by my steak eating, and you're a vegetable eater, you know what I'm going to do? If we go out, I'm not going to eat a big juicy steak in front of you. You know what I'll do? I'll set aside my liberty, and I'll have a plate of vegetables. So as not to trip up or offend or to make their Christianity fail because I decide that meat is okay. I mean, imagine if we journeyed with people instead of fighting with them about the minutia. Say, you know what? If you think vegetables are the way, give me a sweet potato and let's have dinner. <laughs> right? Let's do it. Let's have a vegetable thing and we can make it. I mean, you could fly by Burger King on your way home or McDonald's or anything. <laughs> but as long as you're with them, and you know, they are, he's calling them a weaker. He actually calls them weaker spirits. The weaker brother. The weaker brother, not to offend them, go ahead and walk with them. Mm -hmm. Because Christ walks with you, and you are definitely the weaker vessel. Indeed. Right? So I, I love this fact that God calls us at the end of this speech. It is necessary to walk with him by faith. So um, could, could you explain that phrase to us all um, that we hear repeatedly throughout the Bible, the just shall live by faith. And he's called us to do it again here, that I will live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what do you, so, what do you think that means? So the just shall live by faith. The righteous are called righteous, so the just, righteous, shall live by faith. Not by words, by trust. See, one thing that people they kind of mistake faith, and they think faith is, is what I believe and how I believe it. No, faith is trust. I use the example of a chair oftentimes, where I'll stand next to a chair, and I'll say, I have faith that this chair will hold my entire weight if I stand on it. And I ask people, do you believe me? And they're like, yeah, yeah, sure. And I say, why do you believe me? You shouldn't believe me. But then when I stand on the chair, and so far, it always has worked. <laughs> when I stand on the chair and I say, I have faith that this chair can hold my entire weight. Now you can believe it because you've seen it. It's been tested. And so faith in Jesus, see, we walk by faith in Jesus, in the one who walked by the law, fulfilling the law, giving us the righteousness of said law, I walk by trust in the finished work of the cross. That's good. Amen. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So finished work, that is a phrase that we throw around in Christianity a lot. But what it truly means is that there is nothing you could possibly do, Eddie, to make God shine on you any brighter, to make him any happier with you, because you can't add or take away. You can't, there is no additional. When you were saved, we recognize from scripture, there's a celebration in the heavens. Yeah. The angelic race is like, yes. They came in 
Now, just like a child coming into the world, they don't have it all figured out. There's an immaturity, and he calls the milk of the word and the meat from the word. And I just want to throw this out to you. I think you all need to read a very complicated, hard to understand version of the Bible. Because there are gonna to be topics that are gonna to be easy to understand, and then there's others that you're just gonna say, what is being said here? Now, I don't say this often, but I feel like as we water down versions to make everybody understand every word, it starts to become all milk. Yeah. And there's nothing to chew on. There's nothing to meditate on. It's all free-flowing milk. Now, that's why I think the message Bible is not called a Bible. It's called a paraphrase. It's a, paraphrase. It's a story version of the Bible. It's not the Bible. Everybody needs to understand that. If you've got a message Bible, great. It, it's not a Bible. It's, it's a retelling. It's a paraphrase. It's milk, all of it. But you need a version of the Bible where you're just like, God, I don't know what this says. I'm intrigued. I need to think about this. I need to meditate on this. I need more. And God says, here they come. Here they come. We're leaving milk. You know, that's a tremendous day. I love, I mean, we've had a lot of kids in our house. I love when they leave milk and start to tell me their personality. Charlie's like, She'll eat anything, anything. Just put food in front of her. Now, Savannah's more fickle. I don't like this, nor this. I'll eat some rice. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I haven't even tasted it yet, but I still I don't like it. It's, it looks weird. Yeah, it looks <laughs> weird, texture, right. smells, things coming off of it. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, I, I love I love when children come off the milk because milk's all the same. And I don't know how they do that formula stuff. It's just, it just smells bad. You clean the bottles, those smell bad. Like formula. Ugh. I'll, I'll tell you what I do like. I, I, you like formula? No, no, no. <laughs> to to my shame as an adult, I like baby Gerber baby cereal. Oh uh, yeah. Ooh, with, with, yes, <laughs> with sugar and milk, like a milkshake. Oh, in it. We really digress there. <laughs> what am I saying? There, there's a moment when you're excited for your kids that they don't have to take formula or milk anymore. They're going to move and mature and tell you what their tastes are. And you know, I know we all grew up in a generation where like, you eat everything on your plate. You know, not every palate likes everything on the plate. I've learned that with kids, and I, I've been a little more forgiving to say, I'm not putting that on your plate, because it's just going to end up in the garbage. You're going to have a standoff at the table for the next 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says, the fathers, do not exasperate your children. Yeah, yeah. So I, I put that fight to the side, because I'm very interested. I, I, I like different foods. I, I like garlic. I like, you know, and you all know I like white sauce. Put, put more garlic in it. <laughs> like, I, I like um, different Italian foods especially. And there's just some things that my palate, even though I'm not, I'm not Italian, but boy, I could have grew up in that culture. There's just a lot of foods on their menu, and I'm just like, I like that too. And I like that too. And I like that too. But you start to mature around a certain thing, and you're not on milk anymore, and you become a connoisseur. Oh, I don't like that. I do like this. <laughs> you know what I mean? You become a connoisseur of these things. The Word of God should be that way. You should be able to go in there and network with the scriptures without someone telling you this one goes with that one. You know, there's a, a chain reference Bibles out there. This Bible links these verses together because they go together. Great, but when you discover it on your own, you're now digesting the word of God. You're like, do you know that this psalm is a prediction of the, the Messiah? Uh, yeah, we all know that. <laughs> but when you discover it, yeah, you're like, this, yeah, this sounds messianic. This sounds like Jesus all the way back into the book of Psalms. And you're like, it is. <laughs> that's about Jesus. That, that's the maturity. That's where you're walking by faith now 
moving in this relationship with Christ by faith, and your faith is growing, and your understanding is growing, and you're maturing, and you're saying, this is what a relationship with Christ looks like. His word is just exploding, and it's not the same feeling as salvation, but it is a new explosion in your spirit to say the word is being opened to me when it was closed before. Yeah, like you said, um, that level of excitement that you have at the beginning when you first got saved, it, it starts waning. But every time you read something exciting in the Word, it's like, boom, it boosts it again. Yeah. It gives you a, a, a nice jolt of that excitement. Stop me if, I, if you've heard this before. But I, I recently was listening to the Bible. And I was listening to the story of the son of David, Absalom. Mm -hmm. And Absalom had long hair. And he took over the kingdom, and David ran away. And then there was a war to get the, the, the kingdom established back into David's hand. And so, uh, Absalom was running away on a donkey, and he, his long hair got caught on a branch of a tree. And David's right-hand man, Joab, had heard, along with all the army, David say, treat my son well. A soldier saw Absalom hanging on the tree, comes back and tells Joab, hey, I saw Absalom hanging on a tree, and he didn't kill him. What? You were the king? If I killed him, then you would have turned me in. No, I'm not doing it. Stop, I don't have time to, for, for this. And he grabs three darts, and he threw them, and killed Absalom. And when David heard this, all he kept saying was, Absalom, my son, my son, now, I would listen to that story, and here's how I heard it. I heard the, the prince of peace who was hung on a tree by three nails. Mm -hmm. And who killed him was Jehovah his God. And when the father heard it, all he kept saying was, my father is peace. My son, my son, my father is peace. Because Joab means Jehovah is God. Absalom means my father is peace. And being a prince was a prince of peace. Who hung on the tree. And when Jesus was walking on the earth and people called on him, Son of David, Son of David. The only time David ever said, my son, my son, he was mourning the death of Absalom. And so when people called Jesus, son of David, unbeknownst, they were saying, you who will die hanging on a tree by three nails. It's wild, isn't it? There's always reflection. There's always the Old Testament woven into it. And you never get that story unless you're ready to wrestle with the meat of the word of God and say, oh, there it is again. The narrative of Christ nestled into the story of the death of a son, right? It's, it's all over. You just gotta find it and say, there it is again. There it is again. But if you're willing to just gloss over it and say, oh, there's just another Old Testament narrative. Yeah, yeah. You miss it, you miss it. And I just saw that story. I just saw that message. You've been saved a long time, but it means that there's new nuggets, there's new revelation that comes to the body of Christ, and it's like, here it is. Yeah. Now, no one else will ever read the story the same way, because you share it, right? Share yeah. revelation. Yeah. Right, let's finish out this, uh, uh, this, chapter. this chapter. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in it. So that is his ultimate conclusion to Peter. I like his sub-conclusion, but his conclusion, I mean, drop the mic. He's done. <laughs> like, don't you understand the difference? And Peter should. Peter, of all, of all people, should understand the difference. Here's what living under the law looks like. Here's what living with Christ looks like. But I, you, you've got to wrestle with Peter, though. Because Peter does all the same Jewish celebrations that he always did with Jesus. So it's hard for him. I think it's harder for him to make the jump. To say, I had Passover with the man. 
We went to prayer at the hour of prayer. We, we went together. We went to the temple. We did all the religious. We brought our sin up. We did it all in the, the scope and life with Jesus Christ. We did all of this stuff with him. Jesus didn't become non-Jewish. He didn't. He fulfilled the law. He did it all. And so there's a sense that I think that Peter's thinking is, well, I walked with Christ and we did the law. So we're going to continue to do the law until he finally gets scolded that, no, we don't do this. We don't do this because Christ would have died for nothing if we continue to walk in the law. So I think our challenge, church, tonight is um, what are some things in our lives that we believe firmly that other people ought to do but if they did it, it would actually cause them to slide away from Christ rather than draw near to Christ. And that's hard. It's hard because we all want to say, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we start to create, even like I said in the Assemblies of God, we have the 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God. If you want to be a part with us, you've got to believe at least these 16 things. <laughs> that's just like... <laughs> All right, is, is that borderline pharisaical or does it does it create boundaries for us? Are they healthy boundaries? Well, we've got to believe something. We can't just say this nebulous, I follow Jesus. What does following Jesus really look like? And so I think that's going to start to get ironed out here as we continue to read the book of Galatians. It's going to become more and more clear what following Christ actually looks like. But you've got to have these narrow discussions. It's not this, and it's not that, and it's not that. But there's this begging going on in your spirit to say, well, if it's not all that, then what is it? Mm -hmm. Do tell. And I know that this is, again, a kind of a mystical word, but a lot of it is by faith. And I... My whole life, I've been searching for a better and better definition. Even though I know Hebrews 11 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm a logical guy, and that verse, A does not equal B. <laughs> equal, it, it doesn't do it for my logical brain, so I've always been like, faith is substance? Like, I, I try to put other words in there. And I, I'm just announcing my own struggle with Hebrews 11. 1. But substance to me is like um, children's slime. You ever played with children's slime? It's, it's substance. It's unidentifiable. It's, it's oozing. You can't nail it to the wall. You can't keep it. You can't keep it open, that's for sure. Um, this slime is a substance that lacks definition other than... Oozing, yeah, the shape of the container, the slime. So faith is a substance of things that I hope for, but I can't see it. And I've always struggled with that. It's just like, all right, that means that he must put hope inside of me. That, that's where faith begins. In, the, in, in this room, every one of us lacks hope about something. There are people we've given up on. There are situations that we've given up on. There are things in our lives that we've just, we've lost hope about it. But there's this little child inside of us that still hopes that it's going to turn out okay. Yeah. Right? And you start to look at that, and it's a key component to faith. It's nebulous. It's undefinable over here. But as we start to move in and inspect our heart, what is it that I hope for? What is it inside of me that I really hope for, that I have no results? That is the beginning of it. There's something I'm hoping that's going to transform, but I have no evidence that it's going to change. There's no reality in my mind that this is going to change, but I sure hope that it does. Yeah. And some people have poor parental models, and you just wish one day, God, could you just knock on their skull or something and wake them to the reality of you? 
That is the hope of some people, even though there's no results that's ever going to come to fruition, yeah. right? And if we're if we're going to be people of God, He says, "I want you to hang on to that hope. I want you to pray to me. I want you to talk to me about the hope that I put inside of you. Not just about people, but about circumstances, jobs, situations." And then all of a sudden, everything you do is lifted to the throne room of God. And you start to hope where there is no reason for there to be any hope that this is going to happen. And you either execute that way or you execute some subservient plan. Made of man, full of steps. How many of you ever read, do A, B, and C, these three steps shall be a millionaire by Monday? You know those times? God help us. Because there is no easy way. No. Right. And so you start to recognize, all right, that this thing that he's talking about, that his, his subclimactic point, that I'm going to live by faith in the Son of God, who number one, loved me, and number two, gave himself up for me. I'm not going back to the law for anybody, for any reason, anything. He's put a lot of hope inside of me. And I think part of all of our journeys is to discover the eternal hope that he's put inside of us and start to go after it because he put it in there for a reason. Is that making sense? Yeah. And part, the other part of this navigation that we have to do is there are some hopes that are there by uh, the enemy. False hopes. False lies. False expectations. In other words, there are some, if I could use the ladies in this room, there are some guys that are just not going to change. Right. Mm -hmm. They're just not. Mm -hmm. And you might hope upon hope that they're going to marry you and love you and carry you to the ends of the earth in some Cinderella fashion. And God has been saying to you, he's a nut job. <laughs> Flee from him. Flee. Run. You need to be able to, to calculate what is real hope and what is false. And once you can get into what genuine hope looks like, then you can start to learn what faith is. Because you're going to lift that up to God and say, I trust you for this. Right. Yeah. And the other the awful part of this other part of faith is sometimes the answer doesn't come until you're long gone. Yeah. And that's hard for us. That answers might come after we die. And we're going to somehow carry the weight. But God didn't hear me. God heard you loud and clear. He puts the hope inside of you. Expects you to walk in relationship with him. And then just leave it to him. And so some things are going to happen on our watch. And some things are not. That's not our. That's not our determination. Our determination is I put it in the lap of God. He knows what he's doing. I trust him. Let's keep going. Amen. And if we can get there. I don't think we, I think the, the issue is sometimes we, Pastor Eddie, I think we um, say, well, my prayers didn't work. Maybe I need to be more stringent in my religious affairs. Yeah. And that's the huge, that's the error that Peter makes and need to be argued with. Say that's bad theology, really bad theology. I think God will really like me if I do these things now. Yeah, because it, it eventually it becomes, well, no, no, I, I, I'm saved by faith, but, but, but I want to stay saved by the law. So you, there is a sense of, well, I got saved by faith, by grace, by Jesus. But there are certain things that I now have to continue to do as a Christian in order to stay as a Christian, in order to stay on the path to heaven. And this is where we're going to yep. see later as it comes up. Yeah, so chapter 30. Three opens with, oh, you foolish yeah. <laughs> who has bewitched you. I love that line. So uh, we're going to close it uh, right there. So uh, we are like, out of time.